Well, we are connecting here on the Dave's Gone By Facebookio, Podcastio, Programmio of the stream with our guest in the neighborhood, the lovely and talented. And uh, well, let me let me let me give a little bit of a uh, uh, tell you who she is. We're talking with Jen Maxfield, longtime news reporter in the New York area. Let me let me. Uh, she is a Columbia journalism graduate. She didn't go to Columbia, the country. She went to Columbia, the University in New York. There. She even teaches a little bit at Columbia now. She has been an anchor for Eyewitness News Channel 7, and she is still very much a part of NBC News New York. You can see all her reportage. She's also on the board of Washington, D.C.'s Jewish Women International. And she is the author of this new book, more after the break, which we will be talking about with her. Won't you please welcome to the neighborhood, Jen Maxfield. Shalom, Jen. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Shabbat Shalom to you. Shabbat Shalom. Actually, it's it's Rabbi Sal Solomon. That's that's who you're. Uh, Dave is more of a normal. You'll meet him in about half an hour. But um, we're, we're delighted to have you. How's the, you know, I've read the book. It is actually a really excellent book for people who are embarking on the world of journalism, whether it's for Columbia or my my local Hadassah guide. But the the point is you go back and talk to people that you interviewed 10, 15, 20 years ago for a story in like the worst, most horrible moments of their lives. And you're in, you you do the hit and run journal, you you go in there and it's parachute in, helicopter in, boom, 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 get get the story, then get out. And maybe you follow up one or two more times that week, and then you're on to other things. That's the nature of the beast. You decided to do what? Right. So, uh, Rabbi Solomon, I apologize. Uh, Yeah, so you're right that when we're doing these stories, I like to say, I don't like to say that we parachute in because it's not like I'm a national reporter and I'm going all over the country. I mean, I am a local reporter reporting on the same communities through decades now here in, in New York and New Jersey. But to your point, you're right that the cycle of local news is we get the assignment in the morning, we go out and report the story during the day. Sometimes the story changes two or three times during the day. We air the the news report that night and then the cycle begins anew the next day. So just because the news moves on and the headlines keep changing and the live truck is buzzing all around the tri-state area doesn't necessarily mean that the people who I met on these stories and who I sat with, to your point, on their best, the worst, the most chaotic, the most tumultuous days, those people I do still think about years or even decades after their stories air on the news. Now, and and the idea, that because what I, I mentioned before, or what Dave was mentioning, he also read the book, was saying that, you know, he thought he was going to read it, it's going to be like, oh, okay, here was my career, I went to the journalism school, and then I covered this story, then I covered that, but you really take a more in-depth psychological look at what it meant to you to cover these things, then go away, and then think, well, you know, what what does that do to your psyche when you cry with someone, you meet someone, uh, you, you, you share this moment with them, they go on, and you go off, if, if you will. And then to come back to them 20 years later and say, hey, remember me? And you were surprised, I think, how often they say, oh, good to hear from you. I was astonished at how many people said, oh, hi, Jen. How's everything going? In particular, I would say, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a local news reporter, so I cover the tri-state area. But I did go down. Chapter 2 deals with when I went down to Mississippi to cover Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. And there's one woman in particular, Laura Middleton. I interviewed her, her house was gone. Her belongings had been scattered for miles around the town where she lived. I might've spoken with Laura Middleton for 30 minutes. This is 19 years ago now. And she was in the middle, excuse me, 17 years ago now. And, and it was, in the middle of such a crazy time in her life, right? What must have been a blur of trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces. And when I contacted her, she remembered exactly who I was. She remembered the interview. It was just pretty incredible. And and I'm glad, Rabbi Solomon, that that you said that what you were talking about with the narrative of these stories, because I appreciate that because that really was what I was trying to do here. We've all read the memoirs from different journalists that put 
themselves at the center of the book. They covered this inauguration. They covered this natural disaster. They covered this big news story. I felt like I was interested in writing something different where I put the subject of the news story at the center of the narrative and I come into their life because that is actually how it works, right? They're living their life. They're not celebrities. They didn't crave the spotlight. Something happens. I come in to interview them. I leave. And then a whole lot happens after the news truck pulls away from the scene. And I was really interested in exploring that in these 10 stories in the book. Every once in a while, they're probably pretty grateful because they get exposure if they need money, if they need help. And then and people see the thing on the news and it's like, oh, let's contribute. Let's do up a fund. So that that is helpful, too, you know, for, for all the people who want to say, oh, well, the news just comes there, exploits their tragedy and, and, and goes away and moves on. So there, there, there's a double side to that. Was was there one story that you could, whether it's in the book or not, that was more difficult for you than any of the others? I don't think I could pick one story in particular. I would just say that the most challenging and hardest part of the job is without question, going up to someone at a breaking news scene or knocking on somebody's door soon after they've experienced a, a heartache or a tragedy. That is so difficult. And, and more often than not, people do welcome us into their homes and we're very grateful for that. And I never take that for granted, but you know, you, you do feel that as much as it's your professional obligation to go and ask those questions and get an accurate story out there, it really is asking a lot of somebody, right? To ask them to take time out of their healing or their grieving or whatever is happening at that time to talk to me, a stranger. So let me also ask you where uh, most of the time and what you cover is either Actually, you cover a lot of fun and nice events if you, if you watch the, the things that you're posting on your YouTube channel. But and, and you do aftermath. Something terrible happens. They send the band. Boom. Have you covered events in Medias Res where, where it's like it's happening and it's dangerous and you've worried like, oh, I could get shot, blown up, hit by a building that's, that's shaking or something. Sometimes I, rem uh, I won a local news Emmy in 2018 uh, covering a plane crash that happened. Tragically, the, the two people on board died. It happened right near Teterboro Airport. And, and the live shot, we were actually right next to the plane and, and there was some fire after that. I've certainly covered um, instances where something was actually happening behind me and they might ask us to back up. Um, I would also just cite generally for all journalists who were out there covering COVID, uh, that was pretty scary when, when I was... Uh, my whole family, my kids and, and my three kids and, and my husband, they were all home working or going to school from home. And I'm out and about, you know, going into work at 30 Rock or going out to cover stories that that felt pretty risky at the time back in the spring of 2020. I can think that's right. It, it would have, of course. So, and by the way, Mazel Tov, you mentioned a husband, three kids. Now, now the last name of the husband is Ostler. Obviously, Ostfeld. Ostfeld, excuse me, Ostfeld. Mm -hmm. Ostfeld. Uh, you obviously married the Yiddle. Good for you. Were you, what were you raised? Are you also uh, one of the tribe or not really? I am a Jew by choice. So my Jewish journey is that I was raised Christian. I went to church at the Presbyterian Church in Tenafly. Um, I'm the oldest of six kids. Oh. And I had a great experience growing up in, in that tradition. And I'm very thankful for it. And I met my husband, Scott, um, in class at Columbia undergrad. We were in an Italian Renaissance sculpture class together. And we, we dated for a long time and, and got married by a rabbi and a minister in 2003. But uh, then we had always agreed we'll raise our kids Jewish, fine. So I'm, but I'm very uh, type A. And so I, I said, well, if I'm gonna raise my kids Jewish, I need to learn a bit more about the faith. So I actually signed up for a conversion class when I was pregnant with my first child, but I, this was back in 2006, but I never, I never was, I was not ready to convert then. Neither my husband nor his family ever uh, pressured me in any way. They always loved me for who I was. And so in any case, I learned a lot about it, didn't convert, had my son in 2006, and I was always fine with being a different religion from my husband but it was very different for me being a different religion from my child. And that's when I decided I was going to convert, which I did right before my second child was born in 2008. I'm just wondering why you did not call me for the circumcisions. 
because it worked very cheap. And well, that that ship has sailed. My son is 15, so. I, I, I'm just saying, back in the day, I was first starting out. I had a great discount rig. If you have twins or something, just boom, boom, because like, ambidextrous with it. But just saying, just saying, you know, your loss. That's what. That's all I'm, I'm saying right there. We're talking with Jan Maxfield. So can I ask you, in covering a story, you go there, you're, you're with the editors, and uh, so did you? What is the biggest argument you ever had with a producer about something where you know, well, it should be told this way, or this should go on, or the producer said, "Now nah, we've got to cut this for time," or or so did you ever have an argument with a producer about a story? Yeah, that's sort of the thing you might see in a TV show or in a movie. Uh, that doesn't really happen. To be honest, rarely are things being cut for time because we have so much time. Look, if you're a national news reporter and you need to get your two minute story jammed into nightly news, for example, which is a 30 minute news show, that's, that's a much tougher process to actually get your story on the air. In local news in New York, we're doing hours and hours of news every day, which is one of the reasons why the cycle is so relentless, right? Because you can't just say at the end of the day, I'm really sorry, but we didn't get anything on this story and we won't be putting anything on the newscast tonight. They're relying on you and depending on you to report the story, which is what makes the deadline pressure pretty intense. So no, I wouldn't, and, and it, and certainly I've never had a situation where a producer, I might've sent in a script and somebody would say back to me, oh no, you have to tell the story in this way, or you have to take this angle. They might say in a constructive way, hey, you know, did we hear from this official or did we get that news release? But I've never had anyone try to Bigfoot uh, one of my scripts and try to change it in a substantive way like that. Well, let me ask, let's say you're covering a fire. Was you know, television news, local, they love fires. It's so visual. It, it, it becomes an instant story just because, oh, fire, everybody wants to see it. You go there, the, the van goes zoom, zoom, zoom. You get footage, the thing's burning, smoke maybe, or it's, it's almost out. The fire guy, department guy's there, you got to talk to him or her, right? So, so you get a quote from them. What do you talk to them five minutes and use 20 seconds? Is that about the, the round? And then, yeah, that's about then, right. Do, do you find one person, do you, or you know, one, one tenant, do you find two tenants, do you find five tenants and use the best one or two? What's, you know, how do you know when you've got enough to, to do it? Right, so the process, there are a bunch of different variables. So let's say I have to be on in half an hour. Maybe oh. I'm just gonna interview one or two people, right? Because I've gotta do boom, boom, boom. If, I'm, if it's 10 o'clock in the morning and my story isn't airing until five o'clock at night, I can be a little bit more deliberative about it and maybe interview more people than I actually put on the news. Typically, obviously we need the official line on whatever's happening. So to your point, the fire official at the scene, as far as the eyewitness accounts, what you're always going for is the person who's the closest to whatever you're covering. So let's say the fire was on the fifth floor and we've got a tenant on the second floor and a tenant who lived next door to it on the fifth floor. I want the fifth floor tenant, right? So it's always that hierarchy of, okay, who's the closest to it? Who's the most likely to have an accurate version of events because they actually were close to it. And that's sort of the calculus that goes on at every scene. But again, on the other side of that is, okay, yeah, maybe I'd love to talk to a tenant on the fifth floor, but I've got a live shot in 20 minutes so the person on the second floor is right in front of me. I'll talk to them first and I'll try to get that other person later. Did you ever get uh, flack or feedback like a day or two later where you aired a story and, and then they call and it's like, oh, you, got, you took my words out of context or this looked like what the story was, but it really wasn't? I wouldn't say we get a lot of comments like that. Typically it would be an issue uh, almost like with omission oh, you were doing a story on this school, you actually should have spoken with this person. Or, oh, you, you, know, you covered this fire, why didn't you talk to this next door neighbor? That might happen. And, and sometimes people don't have the context that maybe that person didn't call us back. Maybe that person didn't want to speak with us. The objective is always to have a really 360 view of the story, but we're only as good as the people who are willing to speak with us. And so if we're doing a story, sometimes people say, well, that was a one-sided story. And, and my response is, okay, well, we, we reached out to the other side and they never got back to us. If you want a 
what people would consider, you know, a story that really gives you the full view of it, people have to be willing to participate and speak with us, even if they don't like the fact that we're do the, doing the story in the first place, which does sometimes happen, you know, certainly in like neighborhood disputes and things like that. They may resent the coverage, but if you don't participate in it, then you've left a vacuum for the other side to fill. And you still can say at the end of the report, we reached out to the so-and-so for comment and they have no comment or we, they were not available by press time. So you cover and you say, hey, we tried, you know, we, we, we gave it. Yeah, a I mean, I'm an ethical person and, and I look, I went to Columbia Journalism School. I'm teaching at Columbia Journalism School. It's not that I don't understand what we're supposed to be doing. But again, if people can't commute, if people don't communicate with us and don't respond, I can't control that. Well, let me let me ask you this, um, because I would imagine that if you're going to a Columbia Journalism School, whether it's print or, or video or, or media journalism, you really learn, but just by going out there every time, filing stories, doing it, you know, that's what they're really learning from. So what, though, can you impart from your experience to these rookie journalists? And what do you tell them? What do, what do you try and say, hey, make sure you do what? The class that I teach is video one. That's the primary class that I teach at Columbia. I love it because my they're graduate students and they're interested in a career in broadcast journalism, but not necessarily on air. So some of them will be on air reporters. Some of them will be producers and some of them will think they want to be producers, but will wind up going on air. That happens. So I try to prepare people for any possibility. And these days, obviously the lines are more blurred because the camera's so small that anyone could be getting video or going live at any point. It used to be much more siloed uh, 20 something years ago when, when I was a student at Columbia. So what I try to do with the students is my role in the class, I teach with an adjunct who's an editor at CBS News. He handles a lot of the more technical things about the, um, you know, the, using the camera, editing. I handle editorial, pitching a story, doing interviews, writing the script, how to write for the ear, right? Which is completely different than when you're writing something for a website or for a newspaper. So I have a, obviously it's a, it's a seminar. I mean, it, it goes on and on for weeks, but the key things that I really try to impart on my students in addition to what we were just talking about, about putting together a balanced story, is, is really to understand the, the gravity of what they're doing. You know, you're going into somebody's life, you're asking them to share their story with you, they're putting a tremendous amount of trust in you because you're the one who's going to be delivering the message to the public and, and really understanding that and respecting uh, the people they're interviewing and, and trying to put themselves in their shoes. Because I think the final product of the story is much better when you're making an authentic connection with people. Jen Maxfield here, by the way, the author of More After the Break, her, her marvelous book, which is available, by the way, from Greenleaf Book Group Press, available where all books are sold. Let me ask you, though, you are a lovely person to look at. And I'm not just saying that to, to blow smoke. I'm saying this is a nice thing. And I'm sure on some level it helped you get the gig. How do you respond to something like the News 12 issue where you had people who have been on the air, anchor women and, and uh, journalists, been on the air for all these years and suddenly they're shunted to the weekend suddenly because now they're 40, now they're 50. How do you, under, you, understanding what media is and that beautiful people get ahead quicker, but at the same time shouldn't journalistic standards also be part of the mix and not to mention loyalty. Well, I, I don't know anything in particular about the News 12 thing that you're referring to, but I would just say generally, first of all, I'm 45 years old and I, I was also raised in an environment where my appearance and the way that I looked was never really a big part of what my parents talked about or what they encouraged me to think about. I was always raised with the culture of it's what you do and who you are on the inside. So my parents were very encouraging of us. Um, my, I have two sisters and three brothers, you know, doing well in school, doing sports, being good to your friends, helping your family. It, there was almost no discussion whatsoever of how you looked, what you were wearing. It just wasn't important. It wasn't yeah, when a you priority. TV news, 
you had Pardon to me? know. Well, you started doing TV news. You had to know that you were rising a little faster and that, that you know, they would select the outfit that you, especially when you were anchoring, that, that suddenly it mattered. And, and you know, there, there's literally, there's a guy on YouTube, I would watch out for this guy, who is like, who has videos about your pantyhose. It's like, okay. Oh, well that, I mean, that like, to me, that's sort of like background noise. That's white noise. I mean, there's all kinds of things happening on the internet. But I, I would actually push back a little bit on this notion that I was somehow moving up faster because of how I looked. I mean, I, I've, I think that I think that I'm I think I'm a great writer. I think I'm a good journalist. I think that the way I've always viewed my own and by the way, they don't pick out what we wear. They that we pick out what we wear. I don't have a clothing budget or anything. That's all kind of something I do on my own. But I would just say that in general, my philosophy toward it has been that I need to look in a way that's not distracting. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not a supermodel. My focus is that I need to look in a certain way where it's not going to detract from what I'm trying to tell you about the story. So if I come on and my hair is all over the place or I don't have any makeup on, I recognize it's a visual medium and that people will be distracted by that. And then they won't listen to what I'm trying to tell them about what just happened at the state legislature. I get it. But on the other hand, again, I really try to take that philosophy of, I understand it's a visual medium. I understand people are interested in that, but please let's have a conversation of substance and let's, let's, you know, well, you let's really tell people meeting, what they need to know. When you're teaching at Columbia, do you now see more students who are of color, who are large, different sizes, different ethnicities, different genders, expecting that they can be front of stage in front of a, a in the way that they wouldn't have been 20 years or even 10 years ago? Well, they're not expecting it. I mean, they, they should be. And, and that actually is the direction that everything's going. My advice to my students, sometimes people will ask me, what clothes should I wear? What should I do with my hair? What should I do with my makeup? I, I typically will tell people you should do what makes you comfortable. You should dress in a way that makes you comfortable. You should do your hair in a way that makes you comfortable because the way that the news is going and storytelling is going in general because of the rise of things like YouTube is really telling authentic stories. We are, and being your authentic self, we are not trying to imitate other people. We are not trying to repeat something that's been done before. I encourage my students to be themselves and to, and to let their authenticity shine through. Well, you also groom and, and mentor public speakers and even, have you, have you literally done that for comedians? Where you, um, comedians. Oh, <laughs> I don't think I've worked with any comedians. I don't think I'd be very helpful to them. <laughs> well, I thought you, somewhere I thought that uh, stand up comedians were among the people that you've helped. No, comedians. no. And, and, no. uh, I don't know what I could tell them that they don't already know, but yeah, sometimes I will, I do some media training. Right. And I work with people who may be speaking in front of an audience or people who are uh, doing something for a charity event where they may have to speak on a stage. And for that, a lot of how I try to build people up and, and help them do that has to do with confidence and presentation and preparation. And again, the, the surface stuff that we're talking about with people's appearance, that's part of it because sometimes if you're put together on the outside, you feel better on the inside. But I have a lot of ways that I help people that that don't really have to do with that. It has to do with preparing in advance, whether, or even like talking to yourself in the mirror or practicing your speech on FaceTime and, and things like that, which, which is more about how you feel on the inside. Now, speaking of things on the inside, one of the, the things that I enjoyed watching earlier in the week was the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. Oh my God, this is an Oscar Mai, it's not the, but it's a representational thing. This is an artist's rendering of what they were doing at the Nathan's Hot Dog Cup. So here's here's the question though, are, is your whole family vegan or just you? I don't think I read somewhere that you're, you're a non-meaty person. Right, so I'm mostly vegan. Uh, I occasionally eat fish. My husband's vegan and his brother, Dr. Robert Ostfeld is a cardiologist at Montefiore and he encouraged all of us to go in this direction more than 10 years ago. And that's how long we've been doing it. And I feel great. I have a lot of energy. Um, thankfully, we're all healthy. My kids more or less eat what they want because I think, you know, it's a bit of a different situation with the kid. They can make their own choices about how they want to eat as they get older. But no, my kids are not vegan. 
Well, you, you mentioned that in 2006 you had your first kid. So there's still you still have youngish kids at home then. You still yes, my kids are 11, 14, and 15. Well, interesting. So here's the question, and, and you know, some say, oh, you you wouldn't ask a man this question, but I probably would. Like being a TV person and then having all the stuff that you have to do and being on these boards of, of various things and being a mom, how do you balance it? Well, so being being a mom and a wife to my my wonderful husband are, are the most important things to me, and, and they really are my world. But I'm also very proud of the work that I do outside of the home. And and as you alluded to, being a TV news reporter, it does involve things like strange hours, working holidays, going in on snow days when other people are staying home and and they're cozy with their hot chocolate. So. The, there has to be some buy-in from the family, right? Everyone has to be supportive and sort of on board with what the person's doing. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's all that different though than than other moms who are working and we know many moms are working. And look, I, I write about in the book that I'm not a perfectionist and I don't expect perfection from other people. And I take that philosophy in my house too, where you know my kids know that some days I'll be picking them up from car line from school and some days I won't. And I will make every effort to get to all of their games and dance competitions, but occasionally I may need to miss one. And sometimes people will say to me, oh, well, well how do you do it all? And I'll say, but I don't because I have a supportive husband. My mother and mother-in-law both live within a couple miles. So we're very thankful to that have so the family right support. There. But all the family, oh, this one's over in this town. This one's just uh, like a half a mile away. It's, it's so enclave you. By the way, you mentioned, I think your brother-in-law is this cardiologist. Boom, boom, boom. What, what does your husband do? Oh, what? he's in finance. We uh, met in a class at Columbia. So he's right. not in the news business. We didn't like meet on a story. Now you, at what point did you switch from pre-med to wanting to be a journalist? I was, uh, to your point, I, I, I was pre-med. I wanted to be a sports medicine physician. My dad's a doctor, and, and I did a lot of sports as a kid. So I, that was what I thought I wanted to do. And um, I always wrote, though, for the school newspaper. I wrote for Echo, which is the newspaper of Tenafly High School. And then I wrote for the Columbia Daily Spectator because I like to write and I like to talk to people, but I didn't necessarily think of it as a career path. And then my junior year at Columbia, I happened to see a listing for an internship at CNN at the United Nations. And I didn't have class on Fridays at Columbia. And I thought that could be a fun thing to do when I don't have class on Fridays. And so I was fortunate enough to intern with Gary Tuckman, who's still a, a national correspondent for CNN. And he's a wonderful man and a fantastic journalist. And he really let me get right into what he was doing at the UN, he would let me come with him to news conferences and ask questions and help write the first draft of his CNN radio stories. It was incredible. And the excitement and the passion that I had for doing that really carried over. And that's when I thought, this is what I want to do for a job. Well, the excitement and passion that we're feeling about having Jen Maxfield on Dave's Gone By and also getting really excited about buying her book. More after the break, it's 10 stories that she covered over the years and then goes back to talk in depth to the people those stories happen to. It's really, really a terrific book. Now, Jen, I know you don't have that much time with us, but you still have a little more time, so don't go away. I have to go. I got to get back to shul. They've been waiting for me to finish my sermon. 